Okay, um, my apologies. I have to uh, give this lecture again because I uh, managed not to record my lecture in class this morning. So uh, we'll uh, at least get most of the information uh, in this video uh, with a redo. We have been learning about um, um, stacking and NMO correction and uh, the, what it can do. Uh, including as a, uh, as a kind of linear filter uh, with the example that uh, we stopped with uh, last time. And I don't want to do this whole um, um, PDF number five on dip move out because dip move out is not used that well anymore, uh, not that uh, frequently. But I do want to uh, cover the first uh, few pages, uh, which uh, starts with uh, uh, number uh, 201 at the upper right, um, first page of uh, number 5 uh, PDF, and um, it's about uh, what's known as pre-stack partial migration. Uh, basically, uh, Dave Hales, uh, um, who's a Stanford um, uh, Clairbout uh, graduate uh, from a while back, um, basically Dave Hales' uh, solution to the problem that we're presented with in the process, standard processing sequence. So um, we have the separable um, uh, double square root equation, the SCP, uh, in uh, big M and big H space, uh, which is basically uh, that you first um, exercise the, um, the big H's, which are the move outs in the common midpoint gather of the reflections, the, uh, the observed move outs. Um, and uh, you do uh, NMO correction and stacking relative to those, and you can determine velocity. Um, and then you do uh, post-stack uh, zero offset migration, which depends uh, on the, uh, the big M. That's the slopes in uh, common offset gathers. And then you do time to death conversion. And in fact, you can do them in any order. Um, but uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, this um, um, this SEP is correct uh, only when um, either big M equals zero, in other words, there's no dip, or big H equals zero, in other words, there's no offset, or at least we're using only the very tops of the uh, uh, reflection and diffraction hyperbolas, and we're losing uh, any appreciation for the uh, flanks of the hyperbolas. So the question that Dave Hale asked is, is there a better approximation to the full DSR, the full double square root equation, which is our you know, wave equation uh, representation of, of uh, uh, pre-stack or uh, multi-offset seismic processing. Is there a better approximation that uh, will work in the presence of dip and move out? So some of the things that, uh, uh, some of the problems that we want to solve are the fact that uh, just to get a start evaluating the DSR um, in terms of either M and H or S and G, uh, the, uh, the source and uh, receiver angles, um, you know, doing that evaluation requires good knowledge of the velocity. And we do understand how to evaluate velocity using uh, the NMO operator you know, in the SEP process, the separable DSR process. Now, we're going to look at many other ways of using the DSR, the full DSR, more directly to understand velocity and evaluate velocity. But for now, this is really uh, NMO um, correction stacking is the only uh, process that we have. <clears throat> uh, now, there's also the problem that um, uh, our, our velocity estimates are um, dependent on the dip. And we'll see uh, this dependency in a second. Um, and so if we can account for dip in making our velocity estimates, then we're going to be way ahead um, in their accuracy and, uh, and in their coverage. Um, OK. So um, Dave Hale defines a process of DMO which uh, fits into the standard process formally in this way. Uh, first, you do NMO and stack, you know, uh, derived from the uh, slopes you see in the CMP gathers, the big H's. 
Then you run it through DMO, okay, um, which and DMO actually requires uh, both uh, big M and v, big H. And then you can run it through um, uh, zero offset migration. You can run it through time to depth conversion. So that's the DMO version of the uh, SEP. Now it turns out uh, that once you've done DMO, you want to go back and you want to um, uh, you want to um, uh, do your NMO again, or at least do a uh, a correction to your NMO and stack. So the uh, the approximate uh, uh, processing flow, um, you know, the approximate separation of the operator that uh, Hale ends up with is is essentially applying DMO first. Although that we're going to, you know, if if I was lecturing about exactly how DMO works, uh, I would tell you how you have to do a uh, an initial approximate uh, NMO correction first. But uh, uh, really, he envisioned it as uh, DMO first followed by NMO correction and stacking. Uh, and of course, DMO re you know, requires knowledge of big H and big M. So then there's standard NMO correction and stacking and velocity analysis, and then um, zero offset migration, and then um, time to depth conversion. So that's how uh, DMO is used. And um, because uh, in the years since, uh, um, you know, DMO has been superseded by uh, uh, many other uh, uh, processes, particularly uh, all the processes involved in uh, pre-stack depth migration uh, that can really handle the dip. Um, you know, that's why I'm not going to lecture about the full DMO method. We're going to go on and look at the, uh, the more currently used methods. Uh, but DMO has a very important place in um, uh, in, in the history of seismic uh, processing, uh, you know, in the mid '80s, it's is when it came out. It was implemented by uh, every major uh, uh, geophysical company, and uh, because it could improve those velocity estimates by removing their dependence on on dip, I mean, that really is uh, one of the things that made uh, you know high resolution 3D surveying uh, pro possible. Um, so DMO uh, is still available. Uh, you know, Hale's DMO essentially is still available in um, most uh, processing systems. It's just uh, not very well used. Uh, not used very often. Here's the reference to Hale's uh, 1984 paper in geophysics. Did move out by Fourier transform. The Fourier transform dependency, of course, is one of those things that makes uh, DMO difficult to. Um, uh, to accomplish on uh, complex land data sets that also come from winding roads and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll see why in a second. So we have um, uh, this uh, little uh, setup here of, uh, of our problem. Okay, um, In this cross-section, in this M and Z cross-section, we have a uh, dipping bed that day daylights at uh, M0 um, at, that, uh, at that midpoint. And um, the dip is uh, theta there from the surface, the flat surface. Uh, here's our midpoint M. And then uh, behind it by H, we have, uh, we have a source. And ahead of it by H, we have a receiver coordinate G. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, the reflection point is uh, uphill of the, uh, um, or the offset reflection point is uphill of the zero offset reflection point. So as you open up the, uh, the common midpoint array, the, um, the reflection point uh, climbs up from the, uh, uh, the zero offset de depth point. And of course, none of them are, are uh, directly underneath the, uh, the midpoint. Uh, that's just uh, not, uh, not happening. Of course, this is for constant velocity. All right. So um, we have um, uh, in the CMP gather, there's really two different uh, data sets shown here. Um, if you have uh, zero dip, then you see one um, hyperbolic reflection. And it's asymptotic to a velocity that I should have drawn in here. But uh, you know I, I haven't drawn it too badly, because you can extend a straight line at velocity v, and that's the, um, the asymptote of your hyperbola. Okay. Uh, now, as the dip 
increases from zero, okay, um, as theta increases, then um, the uh, uh, the the hyperbola maintains its fixed position on the uh, on the time axis at zero offset at at tau at t zero, okay, at the zero offset time. But it becomes asymptotic to a uh, a leveler, a less steep and higher velocity asymptotic line, okay, um, and it that that velocity is higher than the true velocity v. Now, now, I, I need to digress for a second about uh, different velocities. You know, so far, we've talked about the real velocity v, okay, which I might call an interval velocity. That's a property of the model space. Okay, that's a property of the cross section. It's a property of the geology. You would measure it with a well, okay, um, or or as a, the product of a, of an inversion of seismic data, okay. Um, there's uh, you know from uh, the model velocities v, the interval velocities, you can determine uh, an RMS velocity, okay. Uh, which is an average uh, kind of average of the model velocity. So the RMS velocity is, and, and the RMS velocity curve, if you have vertically varying velocities, okay, the RMS velocity curve uh, of RMS velocity versus tau, say, that's still in the model space, all right? So the, um, um, uh, but those velocities, because of this dip effect, May or may not have anything to do with the velocities that you observe and you can you can collect directly from the data. All right, and those velocities are these these asymptotic slopes. Those are stacking velocities or NMO velocities, okay, or apparent velocities. These are velocities that you see as slopes of seismic arrivals in the data. Okay, so in a common midpoint gather here in H and T, you would you would see uh, this stacking velocity as the asymptote of the hyperbola you have. Now uh, it's it's you know the province of, of forward modeling and inversion to figure out what the relationship is between the model space velocities the the v the uh, the vrms and the data space velocity measurements. Okay, these are you know you just slap a ruler on a uh, on a velocity in the uh, uh, in, in a seismic section, on a on a arrival in a seismic section, you've got you've got a directly measured velocity. That's a piece of data. It's not part of the model, okay? But very important because it's data. All right. So the relationship between the data and the model space is uh, is going to be very complicated, okay? As we move away from these constant velocity models, um, especially. Uh, but even here, where there's dip. Okay, what you see is that uh, uh, only if you have zero dip does the asymptotic velocity of the of the hyperbolic reflection match the uh, as the uh, the true velocity v. Okay, now if we take this uh, uh, the CMP gather and we um, transform it into um, uh, from uh, uh, h and t into velocity space as we discussed last time. Okay, by doing uh, the Stevie stack process, all right. Then for this this gather gets transformed into a velocity spectrum, and we leave uh, the time axis hanging down. But now it's tau zero offset time, and then instead of an h axis, we have pointing to the right a an NMO velocity axis v sub NMO. Okay, so uh, this one hyperbola, if there's no dip, it appears as one point. Uh, at uh, um, at the correct velocity and the correct uh, and the correct uh, time tau, okay, the correct zero offset time tau. As dip increases, okay, that um, that point moves to the right in this in this plot. It moves to higher velocity, moves away from the correct velocity, moves to higher velocity. So for dip theta greater than zero, we'd find the point over here. All right. Uh, the question came up in class. Then, um, you know, how do you observe this? And um, um, 
in velocity spectra, if you have experience uh, looking at velocity spectra, you've noticed that uh, they generally cone out and, and become very, uh, very uh, uh, broad. You know, the peaks are very, very broad. Um, the the larger, you know, the further down, the larger in time you get. That's not necessarily, uh, and and probably actually is rarely this dip effect. It's just an effect of the. Uh, um, of the the angle, um, the relative angle getting smaller and smaller as you go to larger times. Okay, the deeper the uh, the structure, the less range of angle you can put on it. And if you're looking, you know, over here on the CNP gather, you know, basically very close to zero offset. Okay, uh, which you are going to be with your deeper your deepest reflectors. All right. Um, then you're uh, you're just not going to be able to distinguish, you know, veloc different velocity values very well because you're all up at the apex of the hyperbola. Okay. Uh, oh, and I forgot to note, um, and it's it's worth noting again, you know, in, in the common midpoint gather, it doesn't matter whether you're shooting down dip like this or up dip. Okay. In fact, you you can see that shooting up dip uh, in a common midpoint gather is by reciprocity precisely the same as shooting down dip. Okay? So so whether H is negative or positive, uh, you always have this perfectly um, uh, perfectly symmetric uh, hyperbola in your common midpoint gallery. Alright? It always reaches its uh, shallowest point, its its minimum time point at the time axis at zero offset at tau. Okay, the zero offset time. That's always the minimum time along any of these. I haven't quite drawn that so well here, uh, but if I try to cover it up a little bit, then uh, you can see, uh, you can imagine that uh, on the time axis there at zero H, that's where we should find the minimum time. Okay, uh, that out of the way. Um, all right, so um, you see uh, uh, a broadening of your peaks in the... Um, uh, of your of your peaks in your in your semblance in your velocity spectrum as you as ta as time tau increases, okay that's uh, natural that just comes from the geometry of the experiment as the uh, reflections get deeper and deeper and larger and larger in tau. Uh, if you see a good trend, you know you have lots of zero off or zero dip reflections, okay, and you might see their trend uh, you know through this velocity spectrum. Okay, but you see a few outliers that are at higher velocities, then that's some pretty definite uh, um, sign of, of dip. Okay, if you're in a situation which is not, you know, like many oil fields, but not like um, the uh, uh, the Western U.S. or Nevada um, on land, especially, um, if you have a situation where most of your reflections are flat, or your reflectors are flat, and just a few are are dipping. Then uh, you'll see you'll see that kind of uh, aspect. Similarly, you know if you if you have a main if most of the reflections are flat, and you see a few multiples, then you might have some outliers that are at lower velocities than uh, is uh, proper for uh, that depth. Okay, so uh, uh, you know some basic uh, uh, velocity spectrum interpretation. Um, and and the the take home message here is that just dip alone without any changes in velocities, is going to move those points to the right on the velocity spectrum. We're going to have a large apparent velocity. So, easily observable in the data space, right on the seismic records, uh, but, uh, you know, with this complication of, of uh, not telling us uh, as much about the, uh, the true velocity as we want it. They're an apparent velocity that's higher. Okay, just to, uh, to show that for a dipping uh, reflector, the travel time from um, from S to G, okay, uh, we write that down as T squared is equal to four times the midpoint we're at, the, the midpoint gather is at M uh, minus M zero, the daylight point of the of the reflector, uh, that quantity squared, times sine squared of the dip, theta, divided by the, the constant velocity squared. Okay, that's our, our T zero, right? As you can as you can see for that midpoint, uh, it's uh, it's constant. Or if you take h equal to zero, right, 
this uh, T0 term would be uh, the same. So that's tau, okay? Not, not T0, tau. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, plus uh, 4H times cosine squared of theta divided by the real velocity squared. Okay. So the NMO action is here in this, um, uh, in this second term. Okay. Now if dip equals zero, and I should have written it as t squared is equal to some tau squared, okay, because obviously uh, if, uh, uh, if dip is zero and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the depth is not zero, then you know, tau doesn't go to zero. Okay, but I, I was just using this equation. But so we have t squared is equal to tau squared, whatever that is, depending on the depth. Okay, that's the zero offset time. Plus, okay, here's the NMO part, 4h squared uh, times 1 over v squared. So now we can draw a parallel between these, uh, these two ratios, right? Um, if dip is zero, it's just 1 over v squared. If, if its dip is non-zero, it's cosine squared theta over v squared. Okay, so now we know what the uh, now we know what the effective dip is on NMO and stacking. Okay, um, and it, it comes from this uh, cosine squared and just you know equating these two. Okay, if the dip is non-zero, then the event stacks along a hyperbolic path uh, like we have up here. Still a perfect hyperbola. Still has its apex at the minimum time tau. Okay, the zero offset time. But the, the, the path, the hyperbola, is defined by an apparent stacking velocity. We call that apparent stacking velocity that we observe in the data. We call it VNMO. Okay? And VNMO is equal to the real velocity, in this constant velocity case, divided by the cosine of the dip. The cosine of the dip for zero, uh, for zero dip, the cosine is 1. So VNMO equals V. Right? Simple enough. But as dip increases, then the cosine becomes less than 1, and so the VNMO increases to be more than V. All right. Uh, and again, just a reminder, the direction of the dip doesn't matter. That's the wonderful thing about looking at common midpoint gathers and the whole reason for midpoint sorting. It lets you focus on the velocity without worrying too much on the geometry. Where do you, how do you, you know, where do you go to figure out which way the dip actually is, you know, is it is it positive or negative, right? And you can see that that makes no difference to this VNMO equation, right? Positive or negative uh, uh, dip um, still gives you the same uh, the same cosine, okay? Um, where do we go to uh, uh, to get the information about which way it dips? We go to a different midpoint, and we observe whether the zero offset time is larger or smaller. Okay, that's what tells you the direction of dip. So NMO is acting as a dip filter. Okay, the uh, the dependence of NMO and stacking on the dip theta, you know, through this this simple relationship here, v NMO is equal to v over cosine theta, the dip. All right. Uh, that that dependence means it acts as a dip filter. Okay. So uh, if your boss tells you to stack, you know, to, to take a well log, which has got interval model velocities, and you, uh, you turn those into the well log into uh, uh, RMS velocities, still in the model space, and you stack, okay, according to that in the velocity spectrum, you know, so you're going you know, to be looking at things in the velocity spectrum, you're going to pick up all those reflections that have zero dip. Okay, you're going to intersect this point. But you're going to miss, okay, you're not going to stack in this reflection that is at, at some large, some uh, non-zero dip, okay? Uh, now, if you had infinite frequency data, you would miss it completely, and, and that reflection would not appear at all. We have band-limited data. They have, uh, you know, there's Fresnel zones that are not uh, zero radius, et cetera, et cetera. So what this means is that, uh, you know, you stack along that... Um, um, w along the true velocities, you get the zero dip reflections. They come in fine, and the dipping reflectors are stacking in less. Okay, 
Um, events from dipping structures, they don't stack in properly. They, they still appear, but they're attenuated. Okay? So it's as if we had, we had like we, we checked out in, at the very end of 706. It's like we applied a dip filter to the, uh, to the stack. Okay? Um, so the dipping structures are attenuated. Likewise, if you adjust your VNMO for a particular dip, let's say, all right, most of my reflectors here are dipping at 30 degrees. I, I make my adjustment to VNMO. It's much higher than it, it was. I'm, I'm stacking along a path in the uh, velocity spectra that's meant to intersect those dipping, uh, the semblance of those dipping structures. Okay, well, what's that, what's that going to do? That's going to attenuate the, uh, that's going to attenuate the, the flat reflections, okay? So the dip filtering is, in, in NMO correction and stacking, the dip filtering is always acting, okay? So uh, <coughs> that's a problem that Dave Hale solved with DMO. The problem that it's supposed to solve is that how do we stack in a full range of dips that are present at the same point? Um, and that's what DMO is supposed to allow us to do. And, and the reason for its success, in fact, it allowed us to do that for the first time. Now, why, why do we need to stack in a, uh, a range of dips at the same point? I mean, is that, is that possible? Well, yes, right? Suppose you have a flat reflector truncated by a dipping reflector. That's a termination, right? That's an intersection. It could be a structural intersection. It could be a, a fault terminating a uh, uh, stratigraphy. It could be a. Uh, um, it could be a. The dipping uh, boundary could be the uh, the boundary of a seismic sequence. Okay, and we're looking at at the sequence's internal stratigraphy uh, uh, terminating against the um, against a uh, uh, an unconformity. Right, that's critical. Okay, so so. You know, because of the dip dependence, before DMO, seismic surveys, you know, with with um, you know stolt migration and other uh, zero offset migrations, they were able to accurately image uh, dipping structures. Okay, but they were not that uh, so so structural exploration was was advanced uh, before DMO, but to do stratigraphic exploration, to be able to find and mark all of those uh, terminations and define the, um, uh, the, the seismic sequences, for instance, you've got to be able to stack in um, different dips at the same point. You've got to be able to stack in those intersections, okay? You know, at the same midpoint, at the same uh, tau, you know, you've got two different dips, and one of them is a termination, okay? <clears throat> And when you can see that, okay, then you can start to do stratigraphic exploration, all right, and, and all the benefits from that. So, you know, people have made billions, maybe trillions of dollars, um, you know, uh, from DMO, okay? I, I might go that far to uh, assert that. Um, so DMO, uh, you know, was implemented rapidly after Dave Hale came up with it. It solved this, uh, this problem of... of you know, only being able to stack in one uh, one dip at, at any given place, and then um, uh, that allowed us to to actually start doing stratic, you know, mark terminations, see intersections in structures, uh, and stratigraphy, and actually start to do uh, stratigraphic exploration, which is where how you find most oil these days. Okay. Well, until uh, until fracking. Okay. Now we're back to structure as being very important. Uh, so uh, interesting progression there. Um, okay. So I'm not going to go through the uh, the derivation of DMO. All right. Uh, and I just want to say a few things about the uh, um, the simple process of of DMO, uh, and that's. Uh, um, you know, it's done in the Fourier domain, which is one reason why it's uh, uh, rather tricky, because you have to take a, uh, a horizontal um, Fourier transform over the in the m direction, in the midpoint direction, over your data. 
So as we know, the Fourier domain is risky uh, and it's, it's difficult to apply to data sets that have missing traces or complex geometry, you know, like recorded all, along a winding road. Um, so, um, you know, uh, rather, uh, rather difficult. So the way you do DMO is, uh, and, the, and the way it can be done in most processing packages, is uh, you start by doing at least an approximate NMO correction. So in your NMO corrected uh, uh, 3D uh, you know, data set from a multi-offset data from a 2D world, um, you have uh, that data starts as TMH, right? Has those three axes. And you do some kind of NMO correction with some kind of default velocities that hopefully are close enough uh, and um, and you get uh, uh, tau sub n, you know, NMO corrected uh, time out of that. You, then you do your one D F F T over M, and you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that was that was pretty uh, uh, pretty brazen, pretty hard. Okay, uh, to take a uh, you know 100 megabyte uh, uh, multi offset data set and um, and do a uh, sort it into uh, um, rows. Uh, rows of M and do a DMO uh, with a with a one with that one DFFT, pretty amazing. That transforms M to KM, you know, still uh, corrected. Then there's these, uh, this integration, okay, very much like a, a Stolt uh, migration actually, and um, so that's uh, uh, <coughs> integrating from tau sub N to omega sub sub tau. And uh, it's, you know, it's just another substitution in the Fourier domain. Uh, pretty simple, uh, defined by some equations that I whiz by. Um, and, and it also uses, of course, since it's looking at dip, and, and you have to, you know, where do you get the information on dip? Well, again, that comes in the midpoint direction. That's why we're doing the, uh, uh, the 1D FFT from M to KM. And that's why we, in determining tau sub n, we, um, uh, we uh, or omega sub tau, we use both tau sub n, the NMO corrected time, and k sub n. So it, it basically it's like a Fourier transform, um, and uh, and so we we end up with the data set, uh, you know, dip correct dip move out corrected as well. It's in omega sub tau, um, you know, that's just a Fourier uh, dual of of tau, and uh, the zero offset time. And uh, k sub m and h, right? And then we just do a 2D inverse FFT through the whole 3D data set, right? We go from omega sub tau to tau and from km to m, right? Now you have a dip move out corrected data set. Um, it should be ready for stacking, but uh, you know, first, uh, since it's still for all different h's, I mean, it's still the same size as the original multi offset data set. You go ahead and you do some some more passes of uh, you know velocity spectra and velocity interpretation, and supposedly in this pass now, the um, you know these new passes after DMO, um, you're going to be able to uh, uh, you know look at uh, do a velocity analysis that incorporates all of the different dips that even at the same points. Okay, so you you do some velocity adjustments here, then do your stack. And then, of course, there's uh, zero offset migration and time to depth conversion. All right. So, um, uh, you know, the reason that uh, that I don't use DMO is is really in this having to do the NMO correction first. Um, when velocities vary too much laterally, when um, when dips get too large. You know, when we get away from the mild dips of, uh, of Texas, say, or the Gulf Coast, and uh, or the Nigerian Delta, and we get to the extreme dips and the wild veloc lateral velocity variations of the Great Basin, okay, uh, this doesn't work. You know, you, you, you can't get an initial NMO correction that's good enough in enough places, and uh, you're still doing all of your... Uh, so the DMO isn't working quite right, and you're still doing all of your, um, uh, you know, all of your velocity interpretation uh, 
uh, at the end after DMO, but there's not much data to work with, so it's just not working well enough. That's why I don't use DMO, because my data sets are not amenable to it. But for data sets that are amenable, very effective. Just been uh, surpassed more recently, because you know most prospects now are are not the you know typical uh, you know zero to five degree dips that you you find in the, um, in the the more even parts of the Gulf Coast. You know they were explored and completely developed after DMO, uh, right after DMO was invented. All right, so um, that's all we're going to say about uh, dip move out. And um, now uh, let's go into another uh, another topic. Um, and uh, this is a timely place because we've been looking at NMO correction and stacking. And uh, we had in 706 looked extensively at um, uh, zero offset um, um, at, at, at uh, zero offset migration. And we have seen how they're you know very similar um, transformations, you know, closely related. Uh, you know, they're just the they're just 2D Fourier transforms with a stretch. Okay. So, however we do them, we know that they're they're that kind of uh, very nicely invertible um, uh, linear transform, you know, as is the Fourier transform. So, the Fourier transform has all these nice properties. That means that everything, uh, you know, linearity, invertibility, uh, that everything we do then that's uh, you know just sort of a, a stretched Fourier transform is similarly linear, similarly invertible. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, so we're trying to broaden our, uh, you know, deepen our toolbox, broaden and deepen our toolbox. Um, and so, uh, uh an incredibly useful tool is, uh, slant stacking, uh, in, uh, earthquake seismology. It's, it's, they don't, the earthquake seismologists don't know, uh, what slant stacking is, but they do know what P tau analysis is. Or tau p analysis. Um, it's said both ways, um, and it, it's the same process, uh, just uh, applied to different data sets and for different purposes. Uh, it's the basis of my uh, refraction microtremor, my Remy technology, uh, is really based on uh, slant stack technology. <clears throat> so it's uh, it's one of these amazing, you know, much like the Fourier transform. You know, in, in a smaller way, but much like the Fourier transform, it's one of these generally useful linear transforms. Okay, so in these notes here, number six, we're going to uh, implement and examine slant stacking or p tau analysis uh, for the time being, assuming lateral homogeneity of velocity. So we can allow our velocities to vary in the depth z any way they do. Okay, uh, and you know if we have some x, you know, slow x dependence of velocity, um, some lateral velocity changes, but they're slow, they're gradual, they're smooth. All right, and and we can estimate a v bar z, a, a horizontally average velocity that's not too far from the, um, um, not too far from the uh, uh, the true laterally variable velocity. You know, and, and uh, effectively implement the thin lens term as we did in 706. Uh, that's okay. You know, we, we can still talk about slant stack. All right. So let's um, let's take a look at that. Um, and under it, things will be fairly simple under this uh, v bar z uh, approximation. Um, and uh, let's see what uh, slant stacking is. Okay. Well, first of all, it's very much like NMO correction and stack, except it takes place along straight lines instead of hyperbola. Um, so on the left is an example of how we do an NMO stack. And this is done, uh, you know, we know that the NMO stack can be done in the Fourier domain, uh, but we're going to pop out of the Fourier domain for a while here and, and, and talk about... Uh, the uh, the physical domain, the T and, and X or T and H domain, if you like, T and M domain, uh, those physical domains, 
So, uh, and that's, of course, the way the Edamo and stack is implemented uh, for most of us. So uh, we have this uh, hyperbolic path with t equal to the square root of the quantity tau plus uh, 4h squared over v squared. Okay. And, uh, you know, so here's some, some reflection hyperbolas. And um, although they're not quite drawn that well. Um, and so we, we sum along the hyperbolas into the zero offset time tau. And uh, that produces one trace, um, the stack trace at zero offset. Okay, slant stacking is very similar. Uh, the equation of the, of the path we're summing along is a straight line instead. So we have t is equal to tau plus px, right? So p is the slope of the line. Tau is the intercept, right? And, and uh, of course, that intercept time is just, again, our, our good old zero offset time as we're defining it for the slant stack. I could express it in terms of h instead of x. So that's just tau plus 2 ph, OK? And where's the velocity? Well, look at the, uh, the slope of the line, that p is equal to dt over dx. So that's just the inverse of velocity, all right? So the higher the velocity, the lower the, uh, uh, the slowness. So we call p the, uh, it's known to earthquake seismologists as the ray parameter. Uh, and it's the horizontal um, uh, apparent slowness uh, and just the slope of the line in the tx plot, here represented as a th plot. Uh, so just like uh, uh, NMO stacking, the slant stack produces a single stack trace at h, h equal to 0 from a multi-offset gather. It's kind of a dimension reducing um, uh, operation, you know, as, as stacks should be. But we can also, you know, just like we can uh, uh, use, uh, uh, we can do uh, CV stacking, right? We produce that one trace from each uh, common midpoint gather, okay, in, this, in the NMO stack. But then we can produce more traces at different values of the velocity, right, for a velocity analysis. We do the same thing with the slant stack, okay? We produce that one trace at one value of P. We take a different value of P. We sum along those different slopes. And that gives us another trace at a, di at a different velocity, different apparent velocity, different p. Okay, so uh, you know we could use NMO to transform a gather into velocity space. We start with a CMP gather p of h and t, and we end up with uh, uh, a velocity spectrum, which is p of uh, you know after NMO stacking at uh, a range of velocities. P is a function of v and uh, and tau by stacking a number of traces at a range of v, OK? So uh, what, what that does is, uh, uh, let me just center on that, OK? So here's a CNP gather. We've got a, uh, a small time, uh, low velocity hyperbola. And then down, we got one in between. We get down here a large time, high velocity hyperbola, as you might expect to see. And if we have a velocity spectrum over here, the small tau, small velocity hyperbola stacks into a point here. There's the medium one, medium time, medium velocity. There's the, uh, uh, the deep one, large time, large velocity. Okay. Uh, now, what is the red? Okay. Well, <clears throat> our gathers are always limited. We, we stop recording after a certain time. That's that boundary. Of course, we don't start recording until time zero, probably. Um, so there's always a boundary there at uh, small time or zero time or maybe some negative time. Okay, we uh, we don't lay out uh, receivers uh, beyond a certain offset. So there's a maximum h boundary there, and also we don't. Uh, uh, well, for a CMP gather, um, you know. If uh, if h is uh, is doesn't have a sign, then the the uh, offset can't be less than zero. So it's always truncated at uh, the time axis. All right. Well, those boundaries 
transform through the NMO and stack linear operator into, and remember last time I showed you how NMO and stack is a linear operator, um, it's a matrix uh, multiplication, right, with the interpolation filters along a, uh, as I implemented, a bidiagonal matrix, okay, uh, and, and there's the, um, there's the point, okay, and the edges of the data set, the truncations of our, and there should be truncations at zero offset as well, okay, those transform into these sort of uh, uh, point spread functions, which, uh, you know, spread out the, the type point that we should have at, you know, infinite coverage, infinite time, and zero, and, and infinite frequency. But we don't have any of that, so what we have are these point spread functions. Look like little, uh, um, they look like little hyperbolas passing through. Okay. So, uh, and, and notice that this velocity is VNMO, okay? Observed velocity in the data domain. It's not, it's not a real velocity. It's just the, you know, whatever stacking velocity we observe that's asymptotic to whatever hyperbola. So, very similarly, we use slant stacking instead of VNMO stacking to transform a gather into the P-tau domain by assembling a suite of stacked traces, slant stack traces, that are done at a range of ray parameters p. Okay, So each stacking operation uses a constant ray parameter, and, uh, and we just uh, do that over and over again. We stack over and over again at different ray parameters p. Okay, Now p, the ray parameter, the, uh, the slowness, is equal to 1 over an apparent velocity. It's equal to 1 over some velocity. What is that velocity? Again, that's an observed velocity in the data domain. And it's the x direction or the h direction apparent velocity. Okay, The slope of the arrival in the common midpoint gather, as I'm illustrating it here. So p in h and t after the slant stack becomes still, it's still a two-dimensional data set. Okay, just like the velocity spectrum. Uh, p of p and tau. Okay, and uh, so this um, this uh, uh, small time, uh, low velocity um, straight line here, which is kind of maybe that's representing a a direct P wave, and there's some refractions here, right? So small time, small tau, um, and. Uh, Low velocity, well, that means large slowness. So small tau, large p, that point, that line transforms to a point that's there. Medium time, you know, medium tau, medium velocity, okay, that means also medium p, right there. Okay, large time, large tau, large velocity, small p, right there. So the general trend is going to be from the upper right to the lower left. P is pointing to the right, increase, you know, uh, slowness is increasing to the right, tau is still increasing down. Okay. Uh, now, these boundaries, again, we, we have a limited data set, right? Limited at zero time, limited at maximum time, got a maximum offset, got a zero offset cutoff. Each of those cutoff points, there, 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 also there, 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 each of those cutoff points generates a little line artifact. Now, why and how am I telling you that for slant stacking, the, the data limit artifacts are lines, and for NMO stacking, the data limit artifacts are hyperbolas? Okay? How am I telling you that? That's this idea of semblance. An impulse response. Slant stacking, NMO stacking, and all linear transformations, and the examples we have are um, zero offset migration, Fourier, uh, uh, trans the Fourier transform itself, okay, all of these are semblance calculations. They evaluate the resemblance of the data to the impulse response of their inverse. Okay. 
Uh, so you got to think about that. And next time, tomorrow, I'm going to illustrate that. Tomorrow at 10, I'm going to illustrate that um, with these pairs of impulse and impulse response. Forward slant stack, inverse slant stack. Okay, that's uh, that's what we're going to look at, and that's going to explain why these terminations turn into lines for the slant stack, and why they turn into hyperbolas for the NMO stack. All right, I think I was able to cover most of what I missed recording the first time.